Water. It takes up almost three quarters of the Earth's surface, and it is vital to all forms of life. Water plays an important role in many of plants' processes and is essential for growth. Water is a primary component in photosynthesis, the process used by plants to convert light energy into chemical energy. During the first step of energy transduction reactions, water is split into oxygen and hydrogen molecules. Water is also the primary component of transpiration, which is the loss of water vapor, mostly through the stomata of the leaves. Water is important for regulating the stomata opening and closing. Water also plays important roles for root growth in the soil, seed germination, and is used to maintain water potential and relative water content within the plant, as well as it also acts as a solvent to transport the products of photosynthesis. Plants can become stressed when there is too much or not enough water, and they must adapt in order to survive. Oh hi there. Uh, welcome to the WSHC, the Water Stress Headquarters of Canada. I was just sitting here doing some research on water stress, of course, and I thought maybe you'd like to know a little bit about it. One of the first words that comes to mind when you think water stress is drought. However, drought can be grouped under the term of water limiting stress. Non-water limiting stress can also be defined as saline habitats, which is when there is too much salt in a habitat and a plant cannot take water up into its roots. On the other hand, low temperatures can cause a cell dehydration along with ice crystals that form inside the plant, making it difficult for the plant to access that water. Drought, on the other hand, is a water limiting condition. So in meteorological terms, it's just defined as a lack of rainfall. Drought is when an organism in an environment is not gaining enough water in order to function at optimal levels. It can occur for a short time, or in other cases, it can occur for a very long time, even up to several years. Specifically in plants, drought impacts growth, crop yield, membrane integrity, osmotic adjustment, pigment content, water relations, and photosynthetic activity. Thanks for listening. An example of short-term drought can be seen here in this picture. The plant is wilting, which often occurs around midday, when a plant's transpiration and water loss is greater than its rate of water absorption. The effects of long-term drought can be seen in these pictures of the Sonoran Desert, located in the southwest United States. Data collected in 2006 by the University of Arizona has been compiled into this graph. It shows that during the months of April, May, and June, there are drought conditions where less than 0.25 inches of precipitation are recorded. An extreme case of long-term drought is the Atacama Desert of Chile. Rainfall was not recorded in some areas of the Atacama for hundreds of years. These graphs show that in most parts of the Atacama, no more than 1.5 inches of rainfall is recorded per month. Conditions, soil's water potential is often reduced. At the morphological level, plant growth is affected by drought stress, which is seen in drooping plant source tissue and impaired germination in sink tissue. It is likely that crops' yields are so affected because gas exchange is disrupted due to stomatal closure. Stomatal closure also reduces carbon dioxide intake levels, which inhibits leaf expansion and development. At the physiological level, most plants exhibit an increase in root-to-shoot ratio. The root system is also involved in a signal cascade that invokes the appropriate stress response level using osmolites such as abiscic acid, cytokinins, ethylene, and malate. ABA promotes the efflux of potassium ions into guard cells of the stomata. This leads to a decrease in turgor pressure which ultimately leads to the closing of stomata. Many of the major components of photosynthesis are disrupted by drought, such as the thylakoid electron transfer chain, the carbon reduction cycle, and the supply of carbon dioxide as mediated by the stomata. Pigment oxidation and chlorophyll degradation is typical of oxidative stress. As a result of dehydration stress, there is a decrease in chlorophyll content, chloroplast membrane, and there are changes in the ratio of chlorophyll A, B, and carotenoids in a variety of plant species. Proline is a carbohydrate that accumulates as a first response to drought conditions to cell injury. Succulent leaves and stems, sunken stomata, reduced transpiring surfaces, waxy cuticles, periods of dormancy limited to transpiration in the sun during the day, and specialized photosynthetic pathways such as C3, C4, and CAM photosynthesis. Hi, 
My name is Jason, and as my esteemed colleague mentioned before, drought is one of the main things that can affect plants in a negative way. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, having an excess of water can also be very detrimental to plants. As you might have heard the old idiom, too much of a good thing is not good. Well, the same thing applies here to plants. Now, in the long run and short run, too much water can be detrimental for a plant's growth and overall health and throughout different mechanisms they have to find a way to either endure or overcome this excess of water. Now the first thing that um, is caused because of, of excess water is that the soil diffusion rate within the soil is severely decreased. This happens because microorganisms enter within the soil, deplete the remnant oxygen supply, and cause the environment to either become hypoxic which means that their mitochondrial respiration is just limited, or become anoxic, which means that the mitochondrial respiration is completely inhibited. Now, the second condition that can be caused because of an excess of water is that the plant growth can be severely limited. Uh, this can be caused because of the reduction oxygenation potential, or redox potential, as most of us know it, is decreased. As well, there can be a buildup of sulfides, soluble magnesium, soluble iron, or ethanol within the plant. As you can see here, the first scenario on the left is what is known as water logging, which involves only the root system being submerged underwater. Shown here in the middle is partial submergence, which occurs when only a portion of the shoot system and the entire root system is underwater. On the far right, you can see complete submergence, when both the root and shoot systems are fully beneath the water level. This is the most stressful scenario. Hi, my name is Dr. Hootie, and I'm a hydrometrics technician here at Environment Canada. Today I'm here to talk to you about a few of the effects that Hurricane Sandy had on our beautiful plants and the unique responses that a lot of them had to endure in order to overcome this tough time. Depending on whether a plant is undergoing partial or complete submergence, the plant will respond in a number of different methods. For partial submergence, plants have developed anatomical, morphological, physiological, and biochemical responses. In contrast, however, plants that have undergone complete submergence have developed independent responses from these. And here they are. Anatomically, some plants have been able to adapt the stress of partial submergence by modification of its cortex into a tissue called arenchyma. The cortex will undergo lysogeny, separating, dissolving, and creating this new form of parenchyma tissue containing air spaces between its stem and leaves as a response to ethylene formation. With arenchyma, plants become buoyant, allowing shoots to continue being exposed to the atmosphere. Hypertrophied lenticles, which are enlarged perforations on the stems of woody plants, this response allows for a greater quantity of oxygen uptake by way of the stem reaching to the roots. Lenticles also allow for the elimination of harmful and volatile compounds such as ethanol. Adventitious roots are a replacement to the typical plant root, whose formation is triggered by ethylene. These plant roots provide the same functions as typical roots, however, they typically originate from the stem, contain pores, and generally grow above ground. Another morphological adaptation is hyponastic growth in plants. This type of growth is most commonly found in flooded plants. It is a response of plants moving their leaves upwards and enabling them to grow vertically and therefore as far away from the water as possible. Another physiological response prevents the process of photosynthesis from occurring in plants. This can be caused by 1. The loss of turgor pressure or water in the guard cells of plant leaves, or 2. The closure of the guard cells caused by ABA. Both of these result in a limitation to obtain CO2. The next physiological response is one that responds to radial oxygen loss. Plants that are not tolerant to excess water stress have roots with thin and barrier-free cortices. Because of this, these plants experience a significant amount of oxygen loss radially as the oxygen is being transported down the root in a vertical manner. Because of this, oxygen is now able to travel down the root and reach the apex which allows for deeper root growth in these flooded soils. Biochemically, water stress can cause plants to create reactive substances which are toxic for plants and can cause cells to be damaged or killed. ROS, reactive oxygen species, is one of the main ones which is formed during certain reduction or oxidation reactions of water by the chloroplast or mitochondrial electron transfer chains. Common examples of ROS include hydrogen peroxide as well as superoxide anions. 
Plants have developed a response for the elimination of these reactive species caused by excess water. Plant scavenging can be done by the employment of both enzymatic and non-enzymatic antioxidants. Shallow submergence plants will undergo an escape strategy known as low oxygen escape syndrome. In this response, the plants will rely on the elongation of its shoots to come in contact with the atmosphere. Deep submergence plants will undergo a strategy known as low oxygen quiescence syndrome. In this state, the plants will remain put and keep a constant rate of energy conservation. There are some other additional traits that plants undergoing complete submergence develop. First, the presence of a plant plastron, which is a thin layer formed at the surface of submerged leaves. Secondly, some plants have developed aquatic leaves, which favor obtaining light from being underwater.